Dear listeners, welcome to Faces of Digital Health, the podcast on how technologies are healing healthcare around the world. With me, Tiasha Zaitz. In 2018, we looked into digital health in the United States in several episodes, China, Bolivia, the Netherlands, Africa, more specifically Kenya, Australia, and today we're going to a very small country with only half a million people, Malta. But first, a quick reflection on digital health in 2018. After years of increasing investments in the digital health space, 2018 was the year when healthcare allured leading US tech corporation to get into the game as well. Atul Gawande became the CEO of the Amazon Berkshire JP Morgan Chase Healthcare Partnership. Apple is investing heavily in development and introduced an Apple Watch with an electrocardiogram. The buzzwords of the year were blockchain and artificial intelligence. AI, because it is applied, developed and tested in various fields from diagnosis, process optimization to voice recognition. And blockchain, partially due to the cryptocurrency fever, which cooled down by the end of 2018. Still, around 130 healthcare blockchain projects are currently alive. Plenty episodes of Faces of Digital Health are available about blockchain, so do browse through episodes history to learn more. Another popular topic in 2018 was virtual reality technology, which is advancing in medical education, surgery practice and more. IoT, hearables and voice recognition applications are also surpassing the idea stage. And in the US, healthcare IT in hospitals is enhanced with more and more analytics, encouraging institutions to build surveillance-like analytics departments to optimize care delivery. At the same time, healthcare IT is still struggling with interoperability and user-friendliness issues, causing dissatisfaction among patients and burnout among doctors. So what can we expect from 2019? The eyes will be on results from all the hype topics in 2018. So, more clinical examples on the use of AI, practical impact of tech giants, progress in voice recognition. Hopefully, we will see further improvements in the user experience with healthcare IT. And I believe that with the rising digitalization, what needs to increase is the awareness about cybersecurity and the importance of strong user authentication. If you have a topic you would like to learn more about in 2019, leave a comment on Faces of Digital Health Medium page or find me on Twitter under at ZAJCTJASA. So that's at ZAJCTJASA. You can also leave a review on iTunes. A very big thank you to all the listeners who have already done so. The comments are a constant encouragement and are deeply appreciated. They also help other listeners interested in digital health find the show as well. So thank you. Now to today's topic, Malta. A small island for which Stefan Buttigieg, the speaker of today's show, believes offers a great opportunity to digital health startups looking to test and scale their solution in Europe. Many European countries have various successful national e-health implementation stories, with patients having access to their discharge letters, e-prescriptions and some form of a personal healthcare record. Let's stop a bit with the, the importance of size when it comes to successful implementations. The smaller the country, the easier it is to achieve connectivity. Compared to the US, it's much easier, for example, for Estonia, Slovenia, Italy or Portugal to offer its citizens a nationwide access to some form of data, simply because less stakeholders are involved in coordination and negotiations. And to be fair, 
if we would compare the United States to Europe as a whole because of the size, Europeans are in the same boat as Americans when it comes to traveling to another part of the continent. There is no uniform solution which would give the Europeans access to their data if they seek medical care outside their country. Two important notes. The realization of a European-wide solution is harder to expect due to language barriers and also European-wide interoperability is perhaps not as urgently needed as in the US since the Europeans don't relocate and move permanently as much as Americans. We do travel around for holidays though, so access to medical information can get useful in those cases. Here's the story of Malta with Stefan Butigi. He is a specialist trainee in public health medicine with a special interest in clinical informatics, social media and digital health. He's also the co-chair of Health 2.0 Malta. He believes in the bright future ahead, driven by AI, blockchain and younger generations, which will demand better digital support in healthcare and this in turn drives development. How would you describe Malta? Haha, <laughs> Malta is definitely um, a small country, but full of goodness. You also imagine uh, you only have like those small bottles or uh, you have the small co- bottles of concentrated goodness. Like, that's how I feel Malta is. Malta is a small island. You've got nice weather. You've got a tight community. You must have an awesome healthcare situation. I mean, one of the benefits of uh, being a Malta is that you that one of the main healthcare systems, that means the main hospital that we have, is financed by the government, right? So you have a um, a unique payer provider system, and this way it is also reducing as much as possible the unmet needs. If you if you might have some time, have a look at the Malta Health System and Transition Report of 2017, which really describes this in a very succinct way. And at the same time, what I also find um, interesting about the healthcare system, Mota, is that we are still challenged a bit by high out-of-pocket payments, but that could also mean that's another unique opportunity. So I think we're still figuring out that. And now we also started public-private partnerships. So the government is now collaborating with the private sector. How would that affect digital health? Only time will tell. From the public health perspective, uh, Malta, Maltese life expectancy is high. Uh, you've got an average close to 90% of life, lifespan in good health, which is way longer than in any other EU country. And the biggest issue uh, is uh, obesity rates are a bit higher than the, compared to the EU average. We have a lot of good things in Malta. And... Uh, The life expectancy is definitely one of them. But of course, uh, I think we are, we are a very rapidly growing country. So we have, we have, um, economic progress as well as well. we're building more. And the result of that, we are still haven't figured out, I would say, how to create environments which are conducive to physical activity. There's, there's evidence out there, for example, that we, right now, we're still uh, focused a bit and we have ob- obesogenic environments. There are places which is, which are good for actually going for out for a walk, enjoying the evening, actually doing physical activity. But still, there are some places on the island where this is a bit more difficult. And I have hope that within the next five to ten years, this will change and we'll be able to include even a high-rise policy. Malta only has half a million people. It's a small country, it's an English-speaking country, and you are very optimistic in the way Malta could develop in a digital health sense. Could you describe a bit the current situation in terms of e-health and digital health? And we'll continue with your uh, optimistic views. So uh, Malta definitely is developing in digital health. One of the highlights, I would say, of our digital health work is my health. Why? What is my health? Yes, so my health is our patient portal, but it's also a doctor's portal. And you have all these different, so for example, you can see laboratory results, you can see upcoming appointments, you can see even like health site finder. You have all these things, which might look a bit basic for the current digital health scene. 
when we're already moving into AI and blockchain, for example. But this is crucial. When you have something like this, which works and works really well, and it's, it's something quite positive. And now also, right now, so we have, for example, laboratory information systems. We have clinical patient administration system. We have radiology. We're doing quite a lot in there. But of course, uh, we are still a bit challenged when it comes to clinical documentation. So there are some new hospitals which started with electronic documentation, especially the private ones. But in the main hospitals right now, we're a bit changed. Uh, so right now what we have, we have proxy systems, I would say. So we have a discharge summary, which gives a lot of information. We have uh, uh, other systems as well, which give some information. But at the end of the day, still, we haven't done that leap yet. But with the upcoming projects, so there's a Converge project, which is uh, across the government, so it's across interministerial, and there we're actually investing in electronic health records, e-prescriptions, so we're moving them. And uh, why I am optimistic about all of this? Because Malta, being an English-speaking country, and being a country also which struggles with a number of diseases as well. So, for example, diabetes, we have a prevalence. I can't tell you the exact number because the publication is not out yet, but we're talking something in the region of 10 to 13%. Quite high. What does that mean? That means that, for example, a diabetes company or diabetes digital health solution based, for example, in the US, could be based in Asia or could be based in other country, it could actually come to Malta test their solution, see that it follows all the regulatory frameworks of Europe and then go towards the European market. Do you think that would be easy for for a startup to do? Because then somebody would probably need to relocate to Malta, expand the network to test the solution in the first place. Do they really need to move to Malta? Well, I don't know. That's usually the case. It's usually hard to do this kind of large-scale pilot testing uh, just online. I mean, definitely there is a role for having representatives, for example. But then, of course, these digital head startups could work with local distributors, for example. They could even set up maybe a small representative outfit, which wouldn't take all the resources. But at the same time, um, there is, yes, an opportunity for them to actually come to Malta as well. I mean, there's an ideal lifestyle as well. There's something extremely interesting going on. You are the leader of Health 2.0 Malta. What does that mean? So what kind of activities are you organizing and where are you taking the organization to go beyond just meetups? So I am the co-chapter lead. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Adjantar Trevisan, who is the founder and CEO of Umana Medical Technologies. We're working together on this. But yes, right now, I'm very focused on this road. And uh, what we're doing right now, we're doing networking events, and I see an opportunity there as well. And also, we want to help to be a gateway as well for a potential startup to come to Malta and facilitate as well. So that is something very important. If you have, If you know that someone who actually knows the process, knows what needs to be done. That's very, very helpful for any startup, even if it is just informally. How big is the community in Malta? Malta only has half a million people, so I would assume that if you have 10 companies in digital health, that that's already a lot. No, so we, we, we at, right, at this point in time, we don't have 10 digital health companies, so we're just starting off, really. So we have some really advanced company. But then we also have those companies who are very early stage, and even some of them are at ideation stage, even. So we have a lot of work to do, and that's uh, something very, very interesting. But, but the enthusiasm is definitely there. So, for example, we had our two networking events, and I like to start small. So we had one event with 30 people, the next one was 75. Who are you trying to attract on these meetings? So are stakeholders such as the regulatory institutions, such as the government, also uh, there? Because because the community is small, if you successfully connected uh, all the stakeholders, even if the state of digital health is not comparable to some of more developed countries, you could have a very quick development process. Definitely. I, I see a road there. But I also learned that sometimes there is a bit of this rabbit and turtle approach. So sometimes you move very, very, very quickly and uh, you might not arrive to the finish line. Whereas sometimes there's, when you have this turtle approach where you go a bit slowly, 
and you get there. But definitely, I see our meetups actually as having a bit of a, I know actually there's no really criteria of entry. So we love to have patients. We love to have healthcare professionals, especially, and we're working hard to get even more healthcare professionals there. But you also want designers, developers. We want all these people on board. And, uh, for example, something which really struck me about the Silicon Valley is the fact that, for example, one of the main reasons why Facebook was so successful, because they had a lot of middle management professionals. So you have business developers, people who think all the time how to make the company sustainable, profitable, and move forward. So that's also something that I would like to work on. I would like to have even more law firms, for example, and even more business developers to kind of connect the like the eyes out dot the eyes and connect the teeth so that is something which is very very important and it is one of the secret ingredients i would say of rapid development as well so you have this rapid agile let's say agile way of development but still gradual it's very important for startup teams to have various specialties uh, so various profiles uh, in their a team, so the business side and the medical side and the technology side. But the problem is that somebody that has an idea for a good solution usually doesn't have the funding to really have a huge team of everyone. So what ends up happening is that everybody is aware how the business side is important, but if somebody hasn't been in the healthcare uh, before, um, the development uh, slows down very much when they really start digging into the complexity of healthcare and why it takes so long for a healthcare solution to come to market. I mean, totally agree. So, for example, if you have a business developer who comes, for example, from the airline industry, he might not know anything about healthcare and he'll come to healthcare trying to put, along, put forward this uh, model. This will just not work, and you're right there. Then again, I, uh, one other challenge that we have in Moto, for example, is that we might not have, for example, enough business developers to start off with. So sometimes there, are, there is some compromise done even. So for example, you won't five, find healthcare business developers on the palm of your hands, though you have to try really hard. And you have to look for people who actually do have that fit. And when you find them, it's like you found a jewel or something like that. But I definitely see a role for an onboarding process for business developers. So I think that startups need to work very hard, especially those which are led by healthcare professionals, to create an onboarding process for the business developers to understand the context. So it might mean, for example, write, reading a report of how the healthcare system works and then getting. It might mean actually talking, going to be talk, meet, meet the people on the ground that are actually talking to them, a business developer we're talking about here, or attend a design thinking workshop for example. So there's a lot which can be done to fill this gap. And I, I'm, I'm definitely not giving up anytime soon, so I have a lot of hope. What is the funding situation in Malta for uh, digital health or e-health? On the European level, the budget for uh, ICT solutions is between 2 and 3% of the whole healthcare budget. When it comes to at least uh, investors in Malta, there are a lot of hidden angel investors, so they won't be actually pu publicly visible, but actually have to actually reach out to them and get to know them through informal networks. So that's something that is happening as well. But then again, of course, the government is uh, pushing forward on AI and blockchain. So I think there's going to be a very interesting trajectory forward for startups who are, for, who are working in healthcare, but focus on AI and blockchain. So that's going to be a very, very interesting how that will develop. And maybe I won't give you an answer in one year's time, but I might give it to you in two to three or four years' time and start seeing how this moves forward. In your opinion, does this request for AI and blockchain implementations or inclusion, does it come from the understanding of technologies or just the general hype? So I think it's uh, hype is important because without hype, you don't have questioning. So if you, once you do the questioning, then people will say, oh, all right, then we have to do it this way. You know, it's not just putting a, a word on a presentation and say that this will use blockchain. No, it involves a lot of background work. And 
And even, for example, when we're doing the AI, it also rose other important questions and the, the questions of data as few is. So because of the AI, interest, the interest in AI, the questions started rising up. Ah, but listen, is our data truly digitized or is it just simply stored in a PDF, for example? And because of that, that is actually pushing forward the agenda of digitalization of healthcare. We have even workflows improved and the collection of data, there's an actual effort to actually even kind of streamline that process. So definitely something to look forward to. So I think from what I'm seeing, hype is important and it's crucial in actually developing this. Then again, important for AI is actually to make sure that you're ethical and at the same time, make sure that you have, you actually build a workflow to support AI solutions that later on. You touched upon a really important issue, which is what does digitization even mean? Um, is it just, you know, putting things in a digital form or is it actually changing documents and data in a structured form that can be shared, reused and analyzed? Exactly. That's why we have something like clinical document architecture. It's very, very, very important to actually do this jump. So digitization, as we said before, is actually bringing something which was in paper format, which is also a technology, funnily enough. It took thousands of years to switch fully from verbal to paper. So that's something that we shouldn't give up, actually. When you think about it, they say, ah, oh, they took 1,000 years. And here we're saying 50 or 60 years to do the full changeover. So we should there we shouldn't give up, for sure. And digitalization, for example, it's all about how to literally, for example, if you before you used to write a name and surname of reform, I don't need to write it because you just put in the identifier and bring supported data. And now the beauty of that is that you actually decide on what you already know and literally fill in the blanks. So it becomes possibly a bit more pleasant to fill in data then. You're a digital health enthusiast, but your background is in public health. So tell me, how do you see public health changing thanks to digitization in the next years? So, so public health has a crucial and essential role in all of this. So two, one of the two main things that I could see public health having a role is this. First one is to actually have a role in ensuring equity. That means that the basic digital health solutions need to be available to everyone, ideally. Whereas when you have, for example, um, uh, when you have a premium service, it's more of an additional, op like or a bit, bit of a more pre premium feature. But the crucial and essential features definitely need to be available for everyone and there need to be a reimbursement process which supports this. The second one is definitely re research and ensuring rigor. That means that when you, for example, doing a digital health intervention, there's a pathway. You do a pilot, then you see how that pilot went, you do the necessary changes that need to be done, and then you take it to the next step forward. So that's very, very important. So if I had to sum it down, research and equity. That's the role of public health in digital health. So you believe there's a way of making uh, technologies available on a wider scale? So to everyone, to benefit everyone. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what's, what's, what's all this effort just to find out that only the rich can access this? It's very crucial that it can be accessed by everyone. And even this is a win-to-win -win situation because if you make it available to everyone, then you have more data, you take better decisions, you can even integrate, for example, if there's something like a feed of public health genomics, for example, and taking that to another level. So definitely every, this is a win-win situation. And yes, of course, there needs to be a sustainable business model, but it could be data as a business model, for example. That's potentially one way. The way Google is doing it with search and maps and every uh, other service that they provide for free. So there's like, there's this crucial thing. So I wouldn't be surprised actually if there would be something on the scale of Facebook, but for healthcare. I don't know how to, who would take that role. I I have this gut feeling that either Facebook, Amazon, Google, Google will actually take take this forward. But actually, I hope that it's not them. Why? Why? Because we do we can't we do need that separate company 
who shows independent thinking, who actually leads this vision and is not motivated by other things other than retail data on your social connections or um, even on your search trends. So there needs to be a separate company, I believe, which leads the way. That That's my hope, at least. Why do you think uh, this couldn't be led by the big companies that you mentioned that have the capital and have the capacity to attract new talent from other areas? So instead of having new people that have ideas without any financing, you have them inside the um, financially supported um, environment. I think there is something beautiful about not being motivated by uh, corporate, let's say, priorities and objectives when starting something as gargantuan as this. And I would say it all boils down to values. So each company has their own values. Uh, and if, for example, you would bring someone like Microsoft into the equation, which was the other company that I forgot to mention before, if they come into the question, they will most probably have a corporate outlook towards things. And how they can, how healthcare data can improve that. But if you bring, if you bring someone who is motivated simply by making sure that healthcare is available for everyone at a very low cost, because that would be a motivation, then having someone with different set of values from all of those four, then you can actually take it to that, I think to that step further. At the last European Public Health Conference, you had a short presentation on social uh, media and the leadership we could expect from younger generation. So maybe this could be a final question regarding what you just said. Different values, different mindset. What can we expect and hope from the younger generations? So I definitely have great hope in younger generations because they will drive change because they will demand it. They do not hesitate to do that. And also it is, imagine if you are uh, grown up with a device in your hand and you see this device as literally your gateway to everything. If we don't have our smartphone charged, you know, we'll start getting jittery a bit, you know, because our family are trying to contact us or they want, we want to get our healthcare information or we want to know how to get from point A to point B. So I think definitely that the young generation will definitely drive the transformation simply because of demand. One of the main reasons, for example, why social media took such a big leap forward is because there was the critical mass. So once you have this critical mass, and you're going to have it in healthcare, because we're all patients at the end of the day. It might take some time to do that. But thinking about this, for example, that 75% of the global workforce will be millennials, and millennials were brought up with devices and without wanting to. These are the people who will be voting and they will vote in governments who actually are focused on the digitization and digitalization of healthcare. There's been a lot of expectations about the positive effects of technologies such as the smartphones. However, we now see a little bit of a shift in that sector. Um, creators of these solutions and inventions uh, are warning against their use or we see that they, for example, prevent their children from using uh, iPads, uh, smartphones um, before a certain age. So there is a shift happening where uh, technologies that we hope will bring most are at the same time being a little bit of an enemy that we are trying to uh, reduce in our life. So my vision for technology actually is that they don't get in our way. So right now, for example, I'm holding my smartphone in my hand. But actually, I see technology in the future as just being just another layer on top of everything that we do. Something we will not see, such as IoT sensors, um, embeddable sensors. So I wouldn't be surprised that in 10 years' time, I would actually wear a contact lens, which gives me information as an additional layer. Of course, there are many issues with that. Yeah, the usually scary thing is the data protection and who's gathering all this. That's uh, that's also definitely something that we already started dealing with. But I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, that technology would be something not as an appendage, something extra, something that we have to worry about, but something that we integrated within our uh, 
environment and that's actually something closer to ubiquitous computing actually so you're very curious and excited about how life and healthcare is going to look like in 20 years of course i do see that i mean i can actually see that i would have some pop-up notification that i mean listen you have some chocolate cake right in front of you it's like listen think twice you know and it would even speak to you the ai i would imagine at that point in time speak to you in your own language even so that's i think something something to be excited about you know of course it will scare us of course i mean we can't deny that but that's why for example you see there's the importance of behavioral psychology it's crucial in us achieving a step forward and moving maybe you might not agree with me but i see digital head and head being one thing head will just be digital it won't there won't be a need for another topic it's just head that's all This was the 27th episode of Faces of Digital Health. To subscribe to the podcast, share it with your colleagues and stay tuned even further. Just a quick note, the most listened episode of this podcast in 2018 were an interview with Sally Dub, the CEO of Enlitic on Artificial Intelligence, followed by the discussion with John Nosta on AI, Big Data and Communication Skills in Digital Health, The third most interesting episode was on digital health in China, followed by a November debate on blockchain and a highlight of the role and creativity of nurses in healthcare innovation. Read the recap on Faces of Digital Health Medium page and find the episodes in your podcast player.